My name is Louise Dente, and I welcome you on yet another edition of Cultural Caravan. On this edition, we present a special dramatization of a work entitled The Life and Times of Theophilus Gould Stewart, featuring Ben Rowe in the title role. This work is based on a book entitled Voice of Descent, Theophilus Gould Stewart and Black America, written by Dr. William Sorrell. Welcome back to the Coastal Caravan. Thank you. Yes, you know, um, really this work was just so um, very informative and it really covers a cross section of our history. Please tell our audience what inspired you to write the story about Theophilus Gould Stewart. Well, I wrote about Theophilus who was born in 1843 and he died in 1924. Uh, he was a clergyman in the African Methodist Episcopal Church who wrote seven books, who had an autobiography, who wrote articles for the Christian Recorder, AME Church Review, and a lot of secular newspapers and magazines. Plus he had uh, journals for trips to Haiti and to the Philippines. Mm. Very, very wide, uh, you know, this person just covered so much. And um, in the work, you're going to really be introduced to this wonderful uh, ancestor. And uh, let's, before we begin, please provide our audience with the setting. What, when they open up, we open up to this drama. Well, we said with uh, Theophilus coming home from teaching classes at the Payne Theological Seminary, which is part of Wilberforce University, and he comes home as a cold January day, 1924. He's at age 80, and he's somewhat tired, but he sits at his desk, and he's thinking back on his life as a clergyman, and as a chaplain, and as an educator. Mm. Now we're going to give you a glimpse into the life of Theophilus Gould Stewart, the life and times of Theophilus Gould Stewart, as he reflects on the early years. Gould Town, New Jersey, was made up of honest, hard-working folk. People who may not have had wealth in the physical sense, but their most prized possession was their moral values. My father believed a good man should know how to till the soil, hunt, and provide for his family. He sent me to work in a swamp, cutting marshland grass for animal bedding one day. I was bitten mercilessly by bees and mosquitoes, which made the task unbearable. I complained to my father about these harsh conditions, and instead to teach me a lesson, he sent me to work as a waiter on a coastal steamship. <laughs> this task was more difficult than I had imagined. They watched me like a hawk, and I don't even think they paid me one cent for my efforts. <laughs> I realized then that working in those grasslands wasn't that bad after all, after that experience. <laughs> Mother. <laughs> Mother loved to read all of the classics. The house was filled with books by Shakespeare, Milton, as well as works by Greek philosophers. Her dad believed that girls deserved to be just as educated as boys, and she passed that love of learning straight down to me. <laughs> she and my father weren't that religious. Now, don't get me wrong. My parents were God-fearing people, but my mother told me to question everything, <laughs> including orthodox religion. My questioning of religious doctrines later in life caused me endless conflicts with church leaders. Mother always told me that the Lord had chosen me to walk this divine path. Don't approach God halfway, but come into him fully and be saved or stay away and be lost, she would say. <laughs> I never forgot her prophetic words. Then, at the age of 17, I knew it was time to pick up the cross and walk the straight and narrow road with Christ. I had decided to embrace the Holy Word and join the AME Church. For nine months, I hesitated until the necessary steps were laid out for me 
and I felt the salvation of my soul depending upon complying. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Yes, it was very in interesting to find out that his mother had a profound uh, influence on his decision to go into the ministry. Um, at this point, let's talk about the experiences he had in the ministry, particularly what the experiences were for people like Theophilus Gould Stewart, who were going to the South to provide support to newly freed African-American men and women in the South. Yes, well, this was 1865, right after the war had ended. Mm -hmm. uh, basically freeing about four million people uh, who needed housing, who also needed education, and as the church believed, they needed the, the uh, teachings, the moral teachings. Stewart joined uh, thousands of people who were sent by the American Missionary Association as well as evangelical church groups. Uh, he first goes to South Carolina where the church had been kicked out actually mm -hmm. in 1822 because it was uh, considered involved in the Denmark Vesey uprising. And Stuart was down there, but typically uh, he's far removed from home, uh, lacking in, in resources, mm -hmm. particularly uh, income. So he has a series of letters that he writes to the church asking for funding for himself and for other missionaries. Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna take a look to the scene as it relates to the call to the missionary. Not only was I chosen to do the Lord's work, but I felt it was also my duty to uplift my race from the degradation and ignorance that came as a result of centuries of enslavement. It was my mission to remove the mental shackles of ignorance that kept my newly freed brothers and sisters from thriving in the South. I first began by educating myself on every subject I needed to know, history, theology, reading, languages, and the sciences. I sought to arm myself with the tools that were needed to liberate my people in the South. However, <coughs> things became so rough that I was forced to sell my watch and books and turn to the Freedmen's Aid Society for assistance because it seemed as if the church had turned its back on me. Would I have to be selling pin ballads and quack medicines in order to pay for my basic travel expenses? It was also my responsibility to buy books that I didn't even possess, nor had the means of getting. I had demanded that the church support the missionary work to further evangelize the race. However, <coughs> despite my personal challenges. I still was committed to the mission of elevating a newly freed man and saving his soul in the process. Now, we just wanted to look more into the personal side of um, Theophilus Gould Stewart. Tell us about the women in his life. Well, he was married twice. His first wife was Elizabeth Gaston. Uh, she was a store cashier that he met in a town called Somerville near Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, they married after a brief uh, courtship and they had eight children together uh, until she died in 1893. His second wife was a very famous woman, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney. She graduated in 1870 mm -hmm. from the Women's Medical College and became f fairly wealthy because she came up with a cure for malnourished for children. She had patients of both races. She lived on DeKalb Avenue in Brooklyn. And in an article typical of the Times, as an article in one of the Brooklyn newspapers about wealthy colored men, in the last paragraph, they talked about Dr. Susan mm. because of her wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, she uh, met Stewart originally in 1873 when mm -hmm. he came to Bridge Street Church in Brooklyn, where she was a church organist. Mm -hmm. And they married in 1896. Wow. Now we will uh, hear reflections of uh, the Alpha School steward on the women in his life. Elizabeth and I got married after only six weeks of courtship. <laughs> we managed to survive on her meager income until the money from my work 
with the missionary society had finally come in. She bore me eight sons. Elizabeth gave her heart and mind to raise our sons with sterling characters. I could not have done it without her. She was truly heaven sent to me. I lost Elizabeth in 1893. And after Elizabeth, I married Susan McKinney. <laughs> she was a fine woman and a credit to the race. The Lord truly blessed me with two remarkable women in my life. As the story moves along, um, you, there is the opportunity for Theophilus School Stewart to enter the life and world of politics. Uh, just share with us some of the events of the day that impacted his life. The, at the end of the Civil War in 1865, uh, we have a period known as Reconstruction, uh, which m means that Congress is in charge of restoring democracy to the South. Uh, it also means that eventually uh, laws are passed giving these former slaves, uh, men, the uh, right to vote. Uh, it's a dangerous time period because even though the South was defeated, there's still diehards who did not believe in integration. And many of the participants in politics, white as well as black men, were threatened. Some actually were physically harmed and even killed. Uh, Theophilus, being an educated person, uh, jumped right into the political arena as an election registrar. Georgia is where I made my political debut as an election registrar because I was one of the few educated colored men in the state. My political activism didn't cause me any harm. It helped that I carried a revolver. <laughs> but others were whipped, jailed, and even lynched. My political work didn't interfere with my preaching and teaching. To my dismay, the people of Macon named a newly built church, Stewart's Chapel. <laughs> Lord help me. This honor challenged me to be worthy of such a high calling. The South tested my mettle. South Carolina was my baptism. Georgia, with all its dangers, was my crucible. I came to Georgia with not a rebel present, but left it full of Ku Klux Klan. As the story progresses, um, Theophilus Gould Stewart gets very involved in the politics of Delaware, the state of Delaware. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some of the experiences he had in Delaware. Yes, see, Stewart was an educated man who genuinely wanted to help the, the uh, free people in Delaware. Uh, the problem was one of communicating. How do you communicate with people who never had power? Mm. Stuart is saying, if we stick together, uh, if we vote together, if we get organized together, then we can fight the system. Unfortunately, he did not get support either from his own people nor from the Republican Party. Uh, this led him to think about leaving Delaware. And at that point, there's an opportunity in 1873 to go to Haiti. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can briefly answer a question, the Republican Party, explain why, you know, why the Republican Party, the relationship of the Republican Party to African Americans at that time. Well, the relationship was the Republicans as a party started in 1854 as a party opposed to expansion of slavery. Uh, even though they had many members who were ab abolitionists who wanted to just abolish slavery. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> when the war does end, the Republican Party is talking about giving black men the right mm -hmm. to vote. And throughout the period of Reconstruction, laws are passed that not only give the right to vote, but give equal opportunities, like in terms of public conveyances. Mm -hmm. Therefore, uh, black men who voted were Republicans, and mm -hmm. they were Republicans in large numbers right down until the uh, uh, beginning of Theodore, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's mm -hmm. administration in 1933. But gradually, and we see this in Delaware and we see it elsewhere, Gradually, the Republican Party is kind of making a distance between itself and its black supporters. And so here in the case of Delaware, it, it's, it's very clear. Uh, Republicans basically become allies with the Democrats, and they say, well, let's 
it's not fund the black schools. Mm -hmm. Now, if the black schools are not funded by tax dollars, the only other option would be donations. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a lot of people with money, you have very few donations. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the reason why uh, Stewart decides to leave the state and to go to Haiti. I knew that it was important for the newly freed man and woman to have access to education for themselves and their children. However, the powers that be did everything to thwart that. Whites felt it was against God's will to educate those who in their estimation were barely above the status of monkeys. I had challenged the white power structure to either educate or incarcerate. Either the state of Delaware would have to provide financial assistance for Negro schools or the federal government would be asked to take charge of our education. At an address at a Methodist Episcopal church in Wilmington, I reminded the congregation that one half of the Negroes were illiterate and the rest were poorly educated. In every community, there was a wretched white leech fattening himself off the sole life of colored men. If Satan can employ white men with success, why may not God? All Christians should demand a public school system that shall afford the best possible advantages to all the people alike. Convince Negroes to abstain from alcohol and lead pure and moral lives. Insist that all ministers set the right example of laboring together for the conversion of God's poor. And give sympathy, prayers, and very potent influence for our people. <coughs> I know that um, at some point, Stewart decided to go to Haiti, okay? Could you tell us about some of the events that led to his leaving for Haiti, as well as him, his impressions of the people and culture of Haiti? He goes to Haiti because the church is trying to reestablish a base. In 1824, uh, some of the members of the church went to Haiti. Uh, it was not clear they even were still alive or the church was even in existence. Also, there were people who went in 1859, 1860, uh, as representatives of the Haitian Immigration Bureau, which was a program established by the Haitian government to encourage African Americans to migrate. He, he arrives there, uh, he, his impressions are uh, just based on observation. It's a totally different culture. Uh, there's language issues because many people spoke Creole. He, he writes about this because he does send letters back to the uh, Christian recorder and he also kept a journal. Mm -hmm. uh, his journal is a very frank appraisal of, of what he saw in that island. And it's one that in later years he has some reservations about what he wrote. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So reflections of his stay in Haiti. The upper class residents I met were polite, but they were, in my opinion, ostentatious, superstitious, and overbearing in their ways, or should I say, manners. My French was not adequate enough, especially since Creole was spoken widely throughout the country. After about a month on the island, I felt I was on the verge of having a nervous breakdown. I was stricken with tropical maladies, and most of all, I was homesick for my family and those I had left behind. As I reflect back on my time there, I realized that my reactions to the culture and mores of the Haitians was starkly different than the strict puritanical background I had been accustomed to from Ghoul Town. I was not used to seeing women walking around freely with their breasts exposed for all to see. More striking was that no one seemed to have a problem with this but me. Another thing that concerned me was the eagerness of Haitian families to marry their daughters off to white men. It was as if it was a status symbol. I was also very concerned with the treatment of Haitian women. These women are forced to do most of the labor in the society as though she's little more than a slave. And very rarely do you see a man walking down the street with their wives and in addition, 
men flagrantly had mistresses and did not seem to honor marital vows. <coughs> in Haiti, I expected to visit the island briefly in order to locate surviving African Methodists from the 1824 expedition and return in triumph over a mission accomplished. I thought this could be a place I could bring my family to resettle. However, lack of resources and culture shock made me to rethink this decision. Uh, Stuart spent about five weeks in Haiti and he came home because he's trying to convince the Missionary Society to be prompt with funds. And when he comes back, uh, people are really enthusiastic because they say, oh, maybe we can reestablish the church. Uh, Stuart is very reluctant to return unless he has funds because he has a growing family at this point. And as time goes by, uh, there are letters, even letters from Haiti saying, when is Brother Stuart returning? And other letters to the editors saying, when is Brother Stuart going back? And Stuart is very insistent, I cannot go back unless you can guarantee me funds for my family. At this point, some other members of the church begin to say, oh, he's a quitter. Brother Stuart is a quitter. Uh, finally, he resigns his uh, assignment to Haiti, and then a younger uh, person without a family is selected. Mm -hmm. Now, he later, upon returning, he's reassigned to Brooklyn, New York, where mm -hmm. he becomes the pastor of the renowned Bridge Street Church. Mm -hmm. Tell us about, you know, what was his impressions of the people and the culture there in Bridge Street, Brooklyn? Well, at that time, Brooklyn was a separate city. It, it wasn't part of what we call the five boroughs. And they had a pretty well-established African-American, well-to-do community. Uh, at Bridge Street, you had, you had uh, parishioners who came from old families, families that had traveled abroad, uh, members who spoke German or French or Spanish, who were, uh, we can call them elites. They, they had pianos in their homes and they went to recitals. And also you had people who were working class who came from Delaware and Maryland. Uh, somehow Stuart was able to keep both sides satisfied mm -hmm. and not uh, alienate anyone. Uh, on many of his travels around Brooklyn to the homes of his uh, parishioners, he, he noticed their behavior and their culture and so he decided to write what he considered to be probably the first sociological study mm -hmm. of African-American people. Mm -hmm. And he called it Colored Society. Mm -hmm. uh, it appeared in installments in the Christian Recorder. And it caused a great deal of interest. Oh, wow. Okay. So now we're going to hear reflections on this colored society and social caste system. It was my opinion that there were outside forces which influenced colored society which didn't represent the taste and powers of the colored people themselves. I have always had pride and respect for my African blood and heritage. However, I cannot say that all shared the same feelings about being referred to as African or Negro, for that matter. Most would emphatically exclaim that we were colored citizens. Little white people have yet to treat us as citizens. As a race, we cannot claim a common experience. Slavery is not the glue that will bind us for a slave history is no history. Many Negroes are ashamed of our slave past due to the degradation that was experienced, which was by no fault of our own. Why should we, as a people, continue to accept the status of being separate but unequal? We need to challenge white supremacy and exclusiveness not tolerated. We spend too much time imitating white society and honoring white men. We need to instead validate our own history and our own contributions to American and world history. Now, some may say, why Theophilus? A man of your hue and complexion could easily pass for white in this society and escape the degradation that Negro men face in this racist society as some in my family have done. Well, 
I will continue to say no to injustice and stand up strong and proud as a free man of color. As a people, we are just as good and even superior to whites in physical conditioning and equal to them in intellectual attainments. At an address at a Methodist church, I proclaimed that Negroes were miseducated or at worst, badly educated. It is the role of the church to incalculate the doctrine of self-reliant Christian manhood. The objective should be to take the stoop from the Negro's shoulders and the cringe from his knee and enable him to stand erect. I further advocated for the elimination of prejudice and caste distinctions. Instead, there needs to be the establishment and maintenance of a church that shall have neither white ministers nor Negro members. We must at a single stroke cast down the whole temple of lies respecting our race and believe ourselves to be men, despite the misconceptions of the world. I went on to establish an educational series known as the Richard Allen Course for the purpose of enlightening and inspiring our people. The racist rags of the day, better known as newspapers, depicted the Negro community as darkies who lived in rickety old houses with walls, floors, and staircases filled with grime and dirt. These conditions were not confined to poverty in the Negro community. <coughs> 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 The Negro community, less than 20 years out of slavery, has established banks, colleges, newspapers, farms, and lyceums. Despite the obstacles placed in front of us, we are making, and will continue to make, progress. Thank you.